Welcome to Front Row Seat. I'm Cheryl, and this is my co-host, Beth. Today, we have a special guest, Tom Campbell. He is a NASA physicist. He is also a leading consciousness expert. He is the author of My Big Toe, which documents his theory of how consciousness works and why we are all here. Welcome, Tom. Welcome to Front Row Seat. Thank you, Cheryl. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> Tom, when I scheduled our show, I put the correct date for the Zoom meeting. Then I went and put the wrong date on my calendar. So Tom arrived at the meeting to crickets. That's all. There was nobody there. It was just crickets. <laughs> then the meeting was rescheduled for the wrong date and time I had put on my calendar before. So I was right and wrong because here we are, are on the date that was both right and wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little bit upset with myself, so I looked for the lesson instead of beating myself up. I said, Cheryl, you will never see all the tiny details. So for any appointments, I will need someone to check my work and check some of those tiny details. So Tom, let's talk about mistakes. How can we take the sting out of them? How can we learn to use mistakes as a tool to learn instead of a hammer to hit ourselves with. <laughs> well, a couple of ways, Cheryl. Uh, one is to understand that mistakes are how we learn. So mistakes aren't necessarily a bad thing. They're, they have a, a silver lining in that dark cloud and that's that you can learn from them. The only problem is not having a mistake but not learning from it is, is the problem. So you can have lots of mistakes. Lots of mistakes are good. That means you have lots of opportunities for learning. But you have to actually learn from them. And the way you do that is you think about the mistake and think, what was it that caused this problem? You know, why did it happen? And you'll probably find out if it's something like, you, you know, you put down the wrong day or wrong time or something. It's probably because you weren't paying real close attention to it. You were going too fast. You were uh, thinking about other things. You know, your mind was, was kind of scattered off doing lots of things at once. And you just didn't pay attention to the details. That's probably why. Now, how do you fix that? Well, you just try to focus. You know, when you're doing things that require focus, like scheduling a meeting, then you do it and then you check it, and then you double check it, and then you double check the double check, you know, <laughs> until you, you've got it. Because, see, I have problems like that, too, in, in a sense. Now, I'm a, a left brain guy. I'm a scientist, you know, and I think in terms of logical process. But I'm also very right brain and tend to uh, have my mind in six or seven places all at the same time and sometimes don't pay attention to details. So one of my things is that I go slowly. I don't rush through anything because I know that if I rush through things, I'll make a lot of errors because I'm not really focused on it. So I slow down. I do one thing at a time. I don't try to do two or three things at a time. And I focus on that one thing. And then I tend to check my work a lot. I tend to go back and see, oh, okay, is this right? I put it on that day and that time. Let, let's check. Yeah, okay, that's the day. That's the time. All right, let's see. Have I made any mistakes? Do I have wrong time zones? You know, let's look and see what the time zones were. And I just go through that until I'm sure that I got it right and then I move on. But that makes me slow. I don't accomplish tasks very quickly. So there's a price to pay. You know, if you're going to zip through life, you know, going very, very quickly, then you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Now, Pamela, my lovely wife, and I are just the opposite that way. Pamela does everything quickly. Matter of fact, she can't stand just to do one thing. If she's doing one thing, it bothers her. She has to do something else at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, she can't. We sit down in the evenings and, and do audio books, but she couldn't just sit 
and listen to an audio book. That would be almost impossible. She has to do something while she's listening to the audio book. So she'll play, a, you know, little video games and puzzles and, huh. you, know, all, wow. all, you know, any, any sorts of things. She'll do that while she listens to the audio book because if she just had to sit there and listen to an audio book, it would be too much. She just go nuts. She wouldn't be able to deal with it. She needs to be busy. So she moves very fast. And it's interesting, like when I'm typing on the keyboard, you know, I look at the keyboard, I don't touch type. You know, I'm, I was, uh, I did learn to touch type once long, long, long time ago, but then I didn't type for years. That was before computers. From before computers, the only people that typed were secretaries. You know, they were the people that were, that were the typists. So I didn't have any use for it for a long time, so I lost it. So anyway, I'm sitting there one letter at a time, you know, a couple of letters at a time, you know, hunting and pecking this letter and the next letter and the next letter. And Pam was just with her hands all over the keyboards. But I noticed that I make very few mistakes. Very rarely do I have to push the back button. Very rarely do I have to go back and change something. Pamela makes a mistake about every five or six keystrokes because she's going so fast. Because she used to be a secretary and she used to be able to type at, you know, some very large number of words per minute, you know, 60, 70 words per minute without errors. So she tends to go fast, which is her habit, but she hasn't been a secretary for 50 years <laughs> so, or for 40 years. So she's not as good at it as she used to be, and she makes a lot of errors. And I almost type as fast as she does sometimes huh. because my slow, plodding way gets there eventually with few mistakes. And she makes in the same time, you know, in one minute, I'll only get 15 words done. But she'll probably do 100 words, but she'll have to hit the back and, ch <laughs> and change something and then change something else. And the time we're done. She's still ahead of me, but not that much, not as much as you would expect for the, the speed that she's going. So she's like you. She tends to make a lot of detail mistakes, but that's just because she's in such a rush. Everything she does, she does quickly, even if she has plenty of time. Mm. And she can't do one thing. So that's partly just personality. And if it is, you just accept that, you know, that's just the way you are. You don't necessarily want to change that and say, oh, I need to slow down and I need to do this or I need to speed up. You just say, well, that's the way I process information and I'll just have to learn how to live with that. So if you have to move fast, then you're going to need to check and double check and triple check things because you'll make mistakes. Or just make a move. list. Yeah, if you move slow, then, then it's just going to take you a long time to get anything done. You know, you're going to get very, it's just going to be, you're going to be slow. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing to do is to, you know, most people who are into meditation and, and tell you how to, you know, how you should better live your life, they say things like, be in the moment, be here now, um, you know, pay attention in the present. Let the future go. Let the past go. Just be aware in the present. Well, that's really saying the same thing that I'm saying. You know, you have to be aware of what's going on, what you're doing, why you're doing it. And all of that will tend to slow you down. People who are aware in the present are not moving fast. They're actually taking in everything in their present. You know, the colors, the textures. The, the point and the purpose of their being there, how they're doing it, and so on. All of that is something they're paying attention to. They're not concerned about what's going to happen next. That's in the future. They're not concerned about what happened yesterday. That's in the past. They're just focused on what they're doing now. But that will make them slow. You don't focus just on what you're doing now in a hurry. You do that, you know, slowly. So in any case, that's, it's good practice to do that. It's good practice to be aware of the details. You know, be aware of, of how you interact with other people. 
you know, how do other people interpret what you're saying? You know, to not only be aware of what's in your own mind, here's the idea I want to get across, but how do other people see that idea? What are they going to make out of it? You see, we often, we know what we mean, but other people don't necessarily know what we mean. You know, particularly if we're in a, <clears throat> if we're in a hurry. So again, if you, if you're thinking about, you know, how are other people going to receive the message that I'm sending out? Well, that slows you down because it's not just send, but it's send and think about it, which takes more time. So I think you make fewer mistakes in life if you think about things. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all intellectual, this thinking about things. This thinking about things can be intuitive as well. That intuitive path is a very powerful path, probably more powerful than the intellectual path and the path of logic. But you have to take the time to do it. You have to think about it. And, and uh, so it's a, it's a matter of using tools like checking and rechecking and forming habits like slowing down and doing one thing at a time and really being in that one thing that you're doing. So if you're peeling potatoes, well, you know, notice the potato, notice it's lumpy, notice it's texture, notice it's color, you know, notice all those things, the knife and how sharp the knife is and how easily it might be to cut yourself and notice your fingers and relative to the knife. And, you know, think about all those things and where are the peels going to go? And are the peels going to go down your garbage disposal and then form a big clog down there so that next time, you know, it won't, you know, the drain won't run because, oh, you should have had the, the garbage disposal running and the water running all the time you were peeling the potatoes, you know. So you think about all of the things connected with what you're doing as you do it rather than just this task, next task, next task. <laughs> Quicker, 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 quicker. Yes. It's not, we, we shouldn't see life as something to get through. We should see life as something to be a part of. It feels like getting through it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's maybe, the, that's maybe the differentiation. You know, life is not something to get through. It's no. not like, oh, I got to get this task done and the next task done and the next task done. I mean, that's true in some sense. We do have things we have to get done. Mm. But better to spend more time doing the task and thinking about all the ramifications of it and how it's going to affect, you know, your garbage disposal, how it's going to affect other people. How's it going to affect your hands, you know, if you cut yourself and you know, just have all that in mind and make a habit of that. So we're not rushing from one task to the other. Now it's, it's, that is probably more difficult for females than it is for males because females by their nature, tend to parallel process. They tend to do multiple things at a time. If you're female and you've got, you know, three children running around, you have to parallel process. Yes, you have to. You know, females are made, you know, to take care of children. That's part of what they do. And in that environment, you've probably got six things that you're doing all at the same time. You know, and juggling all those balls at once is, is a, a typical female thing. Now, males tend to be more single focus. They tend to focus down on one thing because they're not taking care of children. They're out trying to catch that rabbit. And if they worry about, if they have their mind on other things, they'll never catch that rabbit because the rabbit's hard to catch and they need to really focus on how they're going to do that. Or they need to work together as a team with other people to accomplish that. And they're very focused. So they tend to be able to focus on a single thing. And when they do, the rest of the world kind of drops away. So you can have a guy sitting there on his sofa looking at a football game and you can be talking to him and he doesn't even know you're in the room, you know, because he's focused. And, you know, then that makes, a, that, that makes his lady, you know, a little annoyed because she's talking to him and she expects him to be able to watch TV and listen to her at the same time. That shouldn't be so hard. But for guys, that's not the way they work. You know, they tend to focus on things, and that's part of their skill set that they need to do the things that, that they need to do. 
you know, it's not, uh, if you're out there, you know, doing, or if you're in a, some kind of a, a fight or a battle or some sort of thing, you have to focus on exactly where you are and what you're interacting with. Worrying about where your friends are or anything else that's happening is going to get you killed. So you need to be able to shut things out and focus just on what you're working on. That is necessary, you know, to that kind of life. So anyway, it's kind of the way we approach things. And some of it, you know, being female, you probably can do several things at once. And you may, like Pamela, need to do several things at once. And that's okay. But don't go so fast that you're just kind of gliding through life, getting tasks done, but not really connecting with any of it. Because everything has lessons. Yes. Even peeling that potato has lessons. Yes. And if you pay attention to things, you'll learn a lot of lessons. Mm -hmm. If you just zip through life getting tasks done, you won't learn much. You'll just keep on zipping, you know, and pretty soon you'll get exhausted, yes. you know, and, and you'll be worn out. And then you'll get cranky. But <laughs> better better to slow down and, and kind of find the lessons in, in what you're doing. You know, if you're peeling a potato, it's not just about you and the potato. There's a reason for that. <laughs> you know, you're preparing food for people to eat. Yes. You know, that's a necessary thing, right? People have to eat. And eating good food that tastes good is better than just eating food because, you know, you don't want to starve. So to go to the trouble to prepare foods so that the people you're preparing it for will enjoy it, that's valuable. That's a very important thing. And you should be aware of that and of its importance and its significance in the big picture and not just see it as a task, you know, to get done with. But it's a, it's a valuable contribution, not only to yourself, but to other people and for their growth and their health that you peel that potato. And if you see it that way, that you're contributing to something larger than yourself by peeling that potato, then there's satisfaction in it. Right. And you can peel that potato and, and you're making something that's going to be valuable to you know, other people. And you take satisfaction from that. It's not just a chore to be done with and a chore right. that, you know, that you wish somebody else would do, you know, and why me? And why do I have to peel all the damn potatoes, you know? Why doesn't somebody else peel the potatoes once in a while? And if you get into that, then, of course, you're doing the opposite. Instead of finding positive value in what you're doing, you're searching for a negative value in what you're doing. And then that always leads to not such a good place. That, that creates problems. If you're going to be negative, about what you're doing, you should probably not do it, or you should probably step back and think about, you know, what the positives are. Forget the negatives. All right, peeling potatoes is not much fun, but that's a task that needs to be done, and somebody needs to do it, and it's, it's good for everyone. It's helpful. You know, it's an important task, significant task. So, Find the significance in it and then do it well. Do a really good job of it. So, and take pride in the fact that your potatoes don't have any peels on them, you know, <laughs> and you haven't wasted any potato. You've just done it just perfectly. So that's kind of the attitude, you know, about making mistakes. I think it's, it's part of it is just the way we are and accept that and then learn tools about how can we, slow down how can we deal with just the way they you know just the way we are yeah i double and triple check almost everything i do because i found out when i was a young guy just getting into science and and mathematics i found out that i understood things pretty well as far as let's say the physics goes but i kept making mistakes on the tests because i'd be in a hurry because it's a time test and you have to get through it so I had the concepts down pretty well, but I added wrong or you know, multiplied wrong or you know, something. I looked at a two and turned it into a four in my mind, you know, mistakes. And I found out that all the points I was losing on tests were mistakes, not because I didn't understand the material, but because 
I was making careless errors. So that's when I learned to double check and triple check everything. You know, that I, because I had a tendency to do that because I was right brained. I was holistic. I wasn't a detail person then. I got big pictures and to deal with all the little details that are in mathematics that you have to deal with, it's not that you sort of get an answer that's maybe close. You know, you have to get the answer. And it's, it's important that you don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. That was very hard for me. And that was part of my process of going from a mostly right brain to you know, a more of a whole brain. You had to develop that left side mm -hmm. to enable me to do that. But I only did it through double and triple checking everything, which made me slow. So when I had a time test, I didn't do very well. When I had take as long as you need kind of a test, I did very well. And that was just me. And I just learned that, you know, that was my life. I had to accept that, you know, if it was a speed test, I wasn't going to do very well because I'd make mistakes. But with practice, you get better, even at going fast and not making mistakes. It just takes a lot of practice to, to do that. So mistakes are good. We just need to learn from them. You know, so that's the whole, you know, that's the whole mechanic of life, right? Is making mistakes and learning from them. Sometimes people feel like they don't know what the right thing to do is. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the right thing? What should I do here? And because they don't know the right thing to do, they don't do anything because they don't want to do the wrong thing. Right. <clears throat> and they're not sure that they can tell the difference between the right thing and the wrong thing. They don't know. They're not that confident. So then they don't do anything. And when you don't do anything, it's almost always the wrong thing. <laughs> you know? Doing nothing is almost yeah. always the wrong thing. <laughs> That's for sure. So it's better, you know, not to do nothing, you know, rather than, Take a chance. Take your best guess. Say, okay, you know, I'm not sure, but let's do this one, you know, and you do it. And then if you make mistakes, you learn from it. Well, now you're learning. Whereas if you don't do anything, you don't learn much. There's nothing to look back on and say, well, how did that go? Because you didn't do anything. You just I... notice life crumbling around you and you're not doing anything, you know, and, and, uh, that doesn't work either. So don't be afraid to do things when you're not sure. Just do them. Think about them. Take your best guess and go do them. Do them fully. Let the chips fall where they may. And then look at those chips and say, now, could I have done that better? Look how those chips fell. You know, they didn't fall where I wanted them to fall. And why was that? And why was it I did what I did rather than, say, the other path that I could have taken? What made me think this path was a better path? Oh, because I really didn't understand, you know, what was going to happen, not this next, but next after next, you know, I, I missed things that, that uh, I could have seen because I didn't think that far ahead. I only was thinking, you know, now and next, but three levels of next, you know, further down, I wasn't paying any attention to that, but I should have been. So then you learn things, and now you take a bigger view. You have to see that bigger view that has not only next, but the next after that next, and the next after that next, and you start learn, learning to focus on bigger pictures. So it's all about growing up and making mistakes and learning and just doing and being and doing your best and trying to understand what went wrong when things go wrong. And accept it. Yeah, well, that's, that's where I was then. I made those mistakes. I was like that. It wasn't nice. You know, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't, I look back on it and I'm not very proud of that, but that's where I was mm -hmm. and accept that. And so that's okay. I couldn't have done anything else because that's who I was. Mm -hmm. Now I'm, now I've learned from that. I won't do that anymore. I'll be nice now. <laughs> yeah, I'll be nicer now. I'll care more about other people more than just yeah. myself now, you know, and yeah. And you, you do that. But so life is a kind of a, a game. It's a fun thing. You give it your best shot. You see what happens. You learn from it. And your next shot will be better. 
be better informed. And you just keep doing that. And, you know, 50 years later, you know, you, uh, you understand things much, much better. You're a much more grown up person. So it just takes time. You know, we expect children to be children. We don't expect them to know a whole lot. Children are very self-centered. It's all about them, their needs, their wants, you know. So we expect children to be self-centered, but growing up and maturing means getting rid of that self-centeredness. That's the yardstick by how we really measure maturity. How mature is someone? Well, how much self-centeredness do they have? If they're still a lot, you know, if they're still very self-centered, they're not very mature. They're just old children. <laughs> you know, they're, they're still acting very childish, even if they're 50 years old, if they're self-centered. So growing up means letting go of that fear and ego, which is what makes us self-centered. So that's kind of the path that we're on. And we should never look back really and feel very guilty unless we did things wrong that we knew were wrong. But as long as we try to do what we think is right, then eh, guilt's, guilt doesn't take place. Yeah, what guilt? There's no guilt. It's just the way I was. Yeah. Uh, life was like that then, and okay, this is now, I'll do better. And you give everybody else that same, that, that same uh, you know, space too. Everybody's just doing what they think is best for now, and that's the way they are. No sense being upset with them. That's just the way they are. You can't force them to grow up. Nope. And if they don't grow up, you know, if they're 50 and still acting like they're 12, well, you just deal with it, right? It's like dealing with a 12-year-old. We know how to deal with 12-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. You just deal with them like they're 12 years old because that's the maturity level where they still are. And you do it in a, in a graceful way. You, know, you don't get angry at them or upset with them or try to lecture them on how they have to grow up because that won't work. It'll make everything worse. <laughs> You say, okay, you know, this, this guy, George, you know, he acts like a 12-year-old, so I'll treat him like that. Yeah. That works. But you just can't let George know that you're treating him like he's 12 years old. Because <laughs> then he'll get angry because he's only 12-year-old, and 12-year-olds yeah. <laughs> get angry when they get upset. If they don't get what they want, they get angry. So you have to understand that that's just the way George is. And, if he doesn't get what he wants, he's, his next thing is to get angry and fuss and <laughs> complain and tell everybody how they're wrong and how they, what they need to do and how they need to do it, because that's what 12-year-olds would like to do. So you have to live, you know, you have to live with that and deal with it how, you know, as best you can, particularly if that, if that person acting like he's 12-year-old is your spouse, you know, or your <laughs> Or your mother or your father, you know, or your sister or brother that's older than you, you know, you still have to deal with that in a, in a positive way. So let everybody be just how they are and deal with everything positively. Anytime you have a negative feeling, anytime you feel stressed, anytime you feel anxious and feel upset or angry or annoyed or not, you know, you're not getting what you deserve, et cetera, et cetera. That's all negative stuff. That coming from your, from your ego, from your fear and from your beliefs. So you know right away, that's not good. That's not healthy. What's good is what's positive. Positive stuff. So... So that was a long-winded answer to a simple question about... <laughs> about it was uh, perfect. It was. Totally. It was absolutely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that so much. That's going to help so much. We love that answer. It was a little long for the right brain side, but it's okay. <laughs> we need to learn to focus and be where we are right now and yeah. concentrate on what we're doing. Yeah. And well, it's probably a little hard to stay focused on something that long, but anyway... It is what it is. That's the way I am, you know. So you just have to deal with me the way I am. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Just the way you are. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that was just so good. For the second half, what I was thinking is we're going to do a random thing and let the um, 
like um, let the randomness come in and just see what happens. So what I was gonna have you do is pick a number between one and six, and then you are picking the question. And nobody knows what it is, because until you pick the number, we don't know. So you ready? One through six, you have to pick a number. Okay, four. What is the difference between sympathy and empathy? Well, empathy is basically you feel someone else's feelings. You're aware of somebody else's feelings. You have empathy for them means you, you uh, connect with them. You, you know, somebody's feeling sad. And if you have empathy for that person, you know, you kind of feel their sadness. You feel where they are. You, you can, uh, it's not just sharing their emotion, but you understand their, you know, what they're feeling and, and what they're doing. That's empathy. Sympathy is when you kind of feel sorry for somebody, when you, you think, oh, gee, they're having a really hard time. You know, I wish there was something I could do to help, but I can't think of anything, you know, that I could do to help. So you have sympathy for them. That means you, you see their position and you, you, uh, you see that the position's difficult, so you have sympathy. But that's different. So one of them is seeing someone and, and actually feeling their feelings, being aware of how they feel. You know what sadness is, and that person's just really sad about something, and you understand where they are, where that sadness is, and how they're feeling about it. So empathy is more important if you're really going to help somebody. Empathy is the more important one because when you really understand how somebody's feeling, you have much higher probability to be helpful because you'll know, oh, the thing to do is not say anything. The thing to do is just sit there and maybe hold their hand. That's, that's the best thing you could do. Whereas if you have sympathy, well, you, you're kinda, you, you see that they're unhappy, but you're not quite sure what to do about it. You have sympathy for them because you know it's not nice feeling unhappy. But you probably do the wrong thing. You probably engage them in conversation and say, well, why aren't you happy? Why are you so sad? And that would be the wrong thing. They don't want to talk about it. They're just feeling sad because they feel sad and they're going to do their sad thing for a while until they get over it. And they don't really want to talk about it. So, you know, being sympathetic is nice, but it's kind of more distant. Being empathetic is more personal and closer to what's really going on. It's a, it's a deeper level of understanding of what the other person is feeling and what they're going through. Right? Do I get to pick another number? Yes, you do. That was All very right. good. That Let's... was under three minutes. I bet it was. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> okay, pick the next number. All right, let's go six. Six. Number six is, why are some people so easy to be around? Some people are so easy to be around because they're positive. <laughs> Period. That's why. They're not negative. They're not complaining. They're not fussing. They're not telling you what's wrong with the world. They're not telling you where they hurt and what's wrong with them and what's wrong with you and what's wrong with the world and what's wrong with the government, what's wrong with the church and what's wrong. You know, they're not just living with what's wrong. Those people are not fun to be around. But if they're positive and they're telling you, oh, I had this happy thing and it's this, that, and I'm you know, good and they're feeling good and they, they, they'll want to listen because it's not just about them. So they don't talk. They want to listen to you. They're interested in you, uh, how you're doing. Well, then you want to be around those kind of people because they're positive. They help bring you up. If you're, if you're a little sad, hanging out with a positive person makes you less sad. You know? So positive people are people you want to be around. And people are positive because they don't have ego and they don't have fear and they don't have beliefs that are constantly making themselves miserable. You know, most misery is people making themselves miserable. 
It's not that that world out there, you know, that world makes me miserable. You know, my family makes me miserable. My job makes me miserable. You know, my parents or my children or somebody else makes me miserable. It's not like that. We make ourselves miserable. It's our one. We're not getting what we want. That makes us miserable. You're not doing what I want. So that makes me upset. I'm annoyed or I'm frustrated because you're not doing what I want. You see, well, my being annoyed and frustrated is my problem. You know, the fact that I need you to do what I want you to do, that's my problem, <laughs> you know, not your problem. So it's, it's the person who's feeling the negativity almost always. That's because they're creating that negativity out of their own needs, wants, desires, you know, their ego, their beliefs. I believe you should act like this. You know, this is what you should do. Well, if you don't do that, then you're not doing what I want you to do, then I'm unhappy. That doesn't mean you should be unhappy. Matter of fact, what you want to do is walk away from that grumpy guy who's always unhappy, right? You want to go find somebody more positive, somebody that'll just let you be you, won't judge you, won't tell you what it is you should be doing and what you should be thinking and how you should be acting. It just lets you be and is positive with you. So that's, those are the people you want to be around, you know, and some people really define themselves in terms of their suffering. They define themselves in terms of negativity. And whenever you talk to them, all they have to talk about is their problems. And when people are like that, well, you can have sympathy for them. You can even have empathy for them. But you'd also just as soon go talk to somebody else because they're not really that much fun to be around. Even if you do have sympathy and empathy for them, you'd really rather talk to somebody else. But people get into that negative thing where the only thing they can talk about is what's wrong. Here's what's wrong with the world. Here's what's wrong with you know, these people and those people. And it's all about what's wrong. And those people are just kind of boring. They're not the kind of people you want to hang out with. So it's just being positive is what makes people like you. And then we can have some, some, some compassion for someone who has identified with their problems and they get into that victimhood and then they can't get themselves out of it because they have no responsibility for any of it because I'm right. a victim here. Exactly. Yeah, and, that's and the, if we have compassion. It's like, oh, I understand that. I think I've been there myself, which <laughs> I know I have. And then you have compassion for them. I think compassion is kind of a learned thing. You have to yeah. practice it. Yeah, compassion's good, but you can't necessarily help them. No. You know, no. and that's the worst thing you can possibly ever be is a victim. You know, that, that, that doesn't mean that there are no people that are victims. It just means that when you see yourself as a victim, that's a problem. Yeah, now you, you can see yourself as in a tough situation. You can see yourself, you know, in a, in a situation where you don't know exactly how you're going to get out of it. You can see all those sorts of things. But when you say, you know, I'm a victim, then right. You don't take any responsibility for being where you are. It's always somebody else's fault. Yes. And as long as it's somebody else's fault, you can't fix it because yeah. you can't fix somebody else. You can only fix you. <laughs> so if you want to solve the problem, you're going to have to change you, not all the people you blame things on. Mm -hmm. So you just have to see the world differently. Oh, that person who's always being mean to me, you know, instead of saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm a victim, you need to say, well, they have a problem. Yes. You know, they have, they have a lot of issues and a lot of problems, and I need to just not be around that person. I need to be someplace else. I need to let them work out what they have to work out on their own. So you tend to avoid them. Again, if it's your, you know, your, your mother or your father or your children or your parents, you can't just necessarily walk away, but then you have to deal with it. And then you have to accept it and say, it's not about me. It's about them. It's their problem. And I will help them by being kind and being nice and being positive because if I just get negative back, it makes everything worse. You know, it sucks me down into that same level. 
So you just have to be positive with them. And if they're complaining and fussing and telling you that you did everything wrong or whatever, you just kind of have to smile, give them a hug and say, okay, I'll do better. See you around. You know, <laughs> you just have to stay positive. You just can't let that pull you down. So yes, there are people who are very negative and you may have to deal with them because they're people you have to deal with. Maybe your boss you know, or somebody else you have to deal with. Well, you deal with them positively. Don't deal, don't take everything personally. They're that way because that's the way they are. They're not that way because of how you are. Right. You see? So they want you to change. Now you have to change, they say. You've done it all wrong. You have to do it my way. And instead of thinking there's something wrong with me, you see, and then eventually becoming a victim because you're, you can't ever seem to do it right. You're always you know, wrong, no matter what you do, then you're the victim. Well, that's going to the negative side. You need to realize it's not about you. What they say is about them. It's how they see the world, not necessarily how the world is, but how they see it. So then you turn around and don't let that bother you. You don't let that make you upset. You don't let that push your buttons. Instead of getting angry, you stay positive and you just say something nice, you smile, you know, and say something nice. And pretty soon, they'll start being nicer to you because you're not playing their game. You're not playing the victim to their boss man, you know, to their being in charge. You're not participating in their, in their uh, game of I'm important, you're not. And they're playing that game because they don't feel important. So they're, they're playing the I'm important because that makes them feel better about themselves. And when you stop playing that game, well, they don't know what to do with you. So they tend to either be nicer to you or they leave you alone. <laughs> Whereas the people that play their game, you know, and fuss and get angry and be the victim and so on. Oh, well, that's, that just keeps that negativity going. Yeah. So you have to break out of that and realize it's, People are who they are, and you have to deal with them in a positive way. Even if it's your boss and even if they're negative, well, then that's a challenge for you. How do you deal with a negative boss? How do you do that in a positive way? So you come to a strategy, you know, and you work it. And if everything fails, well, find another job. You know, go someplace else. Move on. If you can't do that, well, then just make as best of it as you can. It's, you know, that's like sometimes life gives you hard things to do. It puts you in very hard situations, you know, very difficult things. It's not that life is, you know, if you're positive, life is always, you know, beautiful and wonderful. Sometimes stuff happens that is really difficult to deal with. So if you can deal with those things positively, though, then you're okay. Even if it's hard. So that's, that's the way to look at life as a challenge. It's all this game of how do I stay positive? What's the low entropy thing to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's difficult, but you know, the things that are difficult actually have the biggest lessons in them. The things that are easy have just little lessons in them. The things that are difficult have big lessons in them. So when things get really difficult, you know, there's really a big lesson in there for you to learn something, an important lesson, a major lesson that'll probably change your life. So the things that are big negatives are really big opportunities. So That's now that, look at that. <laughs> yeah. So now that big <laughs> negative, <laughs> yeah, you just have to look at it differently. Don't say, oh, that's a big, awful thing I have to deal with. Say, oh, that's a big opportunity for me to grow up, you know, beyond that. So now if you're living a life and there's only happiness, positivity, and opportunities, what's there to be sad about or unhappy about? See, now your life is one of happiness and satisfaction because it's all about positivity and opportunity. What could be better than that? You Nothing. see? <laughs>
That's great. That was an awesome answer. I loved how you circled back and picked the other one up and combined them both. It was beautiful. <laughs> Pick another number. Okay. So I've got, got 10 four, minutes, I think. Four and six. Let's do uh, two. <laughs> Why are left brains more serious? <laughs> because they're all about logical process. They're all about understanding the logic of things, which means they often totally miss, you know, really <laughs> the, the, nat the nature of things or the importance of things. Mm -hmm. They're all about the logic of things. And when they can't find the logic of things, they're kind of lost. They don't know what to do. And they just call those things irrational and usually walk away from them. Mm -hmm. So they're serious because they have to, figure it out. They need to figure it out. And that's a serious business, figuring things out. And once they figure it out, then they have, you know, they make a kind of make a rule or make a little uh, uh, process how they're going to interact or how or what they're going to do about it. So they make this little process and then they work the process. And then they see how they're doing and they work the process. So they're always focused on the logic of it, how, how is it going, you know, taking measurements, uh, that sort of thing, which means they don't have a whole lot of fun in their life because they tend to always be focused on the process. Now, people who are more right brain, they don't worry so much about the process. They're, they probably have some vague idea that there is a process of some sort going on, but they really don't care. That's not important. They have the bigger picture. They kind of see that this feels bad. This doesn't feel so good. And it doesn't really matter why exactly. It just is, it doesn't feel so good. And that's important that it doesn't feel good. And that has to be fixed. They don't think so much as why doesn't this feel good and what are the, you know, what are the elements in it and so on? Well, that's because, you know, this happens, which that, and this, and it's all kinds of, you know, process going on there that ends up in something maybe not feeling good, but none of that process matters to a right brain person because what matters is they don't feel good, you see? Right. So, then when somebody tries to explain it to them, well, the reason you don't feel good is because da, 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 da. well, that just makes them feel worse <laughs> because it isn't dealing with their feelings. It's dealing with whatever somebody else thinks the logic was to generate those feelings. But the right brain person needs the feeling dealt with, needs to connect, needs to know that that, that other person to understand their feeling, accept their feeling, not really have to fix it, just accept it, acknowledge it, and let it be. Give it, give it credibility. Yes. Okay, somebody feels sad right now or doesn't feel good. All right, you know, and you think, well, what could I do to help? And they may say, nothing, just leave me alone. I need some time. Well, Leave them alone. Give them some time. Come back later. You see, or do something nice. Go say, well, I'll go fix them something special and I'll bring it out, you know, some kind of a drink or, you know, a little pastry. I'll, I'll get something special and I'll give it to them. Oh, well, that might help. That'll help a whole lot more than taking them through the logic of what caused their problem <laughs> because they really don't care about that logic that caused their problem. You see, that's the kind of the male-female issue, right? Yeah. We get that a lot. You know, the males are more logical process guys, and the women are more feeling and more intuitive <laughs> and right-brain girls. And the guys always want to fix it. And that just, makes, <laughs> that just makes it worse because that's not the problem. They just need to be with you and accept that feeling and, and uh, let you be and, and uh, then do something special to distract you. <laughs> Whatever, you know, that's what they need to do. But instead, they want to give you the logical solution so that you don't feel bad anymore. But see, you're feeling bad doesn't have anything to do with logic. No. 
and giving you a logical solution. Oh, well, that's easy. All you need to do is this, this, and this. And stop know? it. Yeah, and then, and then you won't feel bad anymore. You know, that's not helpful. You see, that's, that's the left brain approach to things. So left brain people, yes, tend to be more serious. And, of course, left brain people always think they have all the answers. You know? <laughs> that's just part of being left brain. When you're logical, you, well, people think they're logical, but they're not really nearly as logical as they think. They, <laughs> they've got a lot of assumptions, a lot of beliefs, a lot of ego, a lot of their own fears that they cast as logic. You know, but they don't see that. So almost everybody thinks they're logical, reasonable, rational. For the most part, we're not. Humans are not particularly rational things. You know, they're, they're not. They tend to live on feelings and emotions, yeah. and all of that stuff comes, you know, from a deeper place than, than logic comes from. So, so even when you have a, a left-brain person who thinks they know everything and thinks they have all the answers, and if you would just pay attention and do what they say, everything would be just fine but they're actually missing the point entirely and there's nothing you can say to make them see the point. You just need to think, well, they're trying. <laughs> that's, all, that's all they know how to do. They're trying. they're trying. They're just not, they just don't understand. And they can't understand because they're not there. They're not in that space that you're in. And they have this belief and it's just a belief that logic solves everything. <laughs> That's the belief. If you just understood it, you wouldn't feel bad. You just understood. But here, let me explain it to you, and then you won't feel bad. You see? So people who are left brain tend to think, one, that they're logical, even when they're not. And two, they tend to think that they know the answers to almost everything. That's part of being logical. It's kind of pseudo-logical in the sense that you, you think of it as being logical and rational, but really, it's a, an, it's a, a conglomeration of beliefs and ego and fears and, and knowledge and experience. You know, it's all that stuff kind of all kludged together. And you can, you know, a good left brain uh, person can come up with a good explanation for anything. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, you ask them something and... Very seldom was the, does a person who's really left brain ever say, I don't know. That's almost a, a, an impossible thing for them to say. They almost never say, I don't know. Because they'll come up with something <laughs> because you've asked them to or they think they should or you, you need them to. So they'll come up with something and uh, it won't necessarily be rational or logical, but it'll seem that way to them. And they know that if you just listen and pay attention and think the way they think, that you'd be over it because they're not sad. They're not unhappy. They're not having a bad time. So it's just, you know, you have to let people be who they are. You know, you can't expect other people to be like you. But we do always expect other people to be like us. That's how we judge other people. Yeah, we just think they are. Yeah, we judge other people as, uh, how close they are to us, mm -hmm. because if they're not like us, then they're wrong. And if they are like us, they're right. So we look at other people and say, oh, that's, they're wrong. What that really means is that's not the way I see it. That's not the way I'd react to it. That's not the way I'd do it. Right. That's what people mean when they point at somebody and say they're wrong. They're talking about that person is not doing it the way they would do it. Therefore, they're wrong which means any way that they would do it is defined as right. And almost everybody walking around feels that way. Left brain, right brain, you know, strong brain, weak brain. <laughs> most everybody feels that what, the way they do it and the way they think about it is the right way. And the way other people who disagree with them think about it is the wrong way. So we kind of judge everybody by ourselves. So you see some, some left brain guy walks up to you and you say, I'm just not feeling very good. You know, give me a moment. 
And he thinks, well, if that were me, I'd be thinking why. And I'd look and somebody had gave me a solution. I'd really appreciate it. So I'll just give her a solution to what it is she should do. And that'll help because they think you're just like them and that that's going to help, but you're not. And you look at them and say, Oh no, he's going to try to fix it. Uh, I don't want it. I don't need him to fix it. I just have this problem and he doesn't even understand the first thing about this problem. And he thinks he's going to fix it. And instead of being annoyed by that and snapping, you can just say, well, that's, that's he's him. He's trying. He's trying. <laughs> trying. That's the only thing he knows how to do to fix it. Yeah. He's doing what he's, he is approaching you the way he would need to be approached in a similar situation. Mm. See, so we all look at everybody else and interact with them as if they were us. We yeah. judge them that they're like us. And you look at that right brain person and say, he just will never understand. <laughs> Even if I told him, he wouldn't understand. Whatever I told him, he would tell me how to fix that, you know, and why it was right or why it was wrong. And that's not the point. I just need a little empathy, empathy. Maybe even <laughs> a little sympathy. I just need a little, you know, tender, loving care. That's what I need. Help I don't need, me. I don't, yeah, I don't need an explanation. You know? right. Just bring me a present, uh, do something, <laughs> do something nice. Uh, tell me you love me, you know, just hold my hand and yeah. be quiet. You know, those I kinds of to, things. I used to tell my late husband that the two most important words he could say to me is, I understand. Don't try to fix it. Just yeah. even if you don't understand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> even if I'm acting crazy, you know. Yeah. But if you just, and that would just help me so much for him to just sit there, like you're saying, and not say, well, yeah. this is, you know, why that occurred, X, Y, and Z. <laughs> if you just would have done things differently, because then that would make me think, oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> just, I understand. Yeah. Because see, the problem is when, when some guy tries to explain things to you and fix the situation, it just makes you feel worse. It does. Because now it does. what, what yeah. they're telling you is that you're doing it all wrong. Yeah, right. That you're and looking I knew at that it you wrong. To fix it. And I knew where he was coming from, but I just said, if you'll just take a minute and just say, I understand. <laughs> and it don't say nothing <laughs> else. Like, exactly. And he really, he did. He took that to heart and he learned to do that and it helped things. <laughs> yeah. Of course, what he's thinking is, I understand that I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I, said, yeah, I said, even if you're thinking that in your head, just don't tell me. <laughs> exactly. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful talk this was. It was the best thing. You know, I have lived my entire existence to be here right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Um, we're right out of time. And yeah. Tom has things he's got to do. He's busy. So for the final question, it's not really a question. It has to be done because it's always done this way. Why do some people love you more than rocks and frogs? <laughs> <laughs> because that's just the way they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Tom. That was brilliant. I just, I'm so excited. I can't wait to share it with other people and see what they think. Yeah. 